Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Our keynote speaker this evening is marking his 20th anniversary as a member of the Knights of Columbus. Ordained in 1970 as a priest of the Order of Friars Minor Capuchin, he was appointed coadjutor bishop of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands in 1984. In 1992, he was appointed bishop of Fall River, where he served until 2002, when he was appointed bishop of Palm Beach. And then in 2003, Pope John Paul II appointed him Archbishop of Boston, where he continues to serve today. He was among the first cardinals created by Pope Benedict XVI in 2006. And just a month after his election, Pope Francis appointed his eminence to a special commission of eight cardinals from around the world to counsel our Holy Father on the administration of the Universal Church. So join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker this evening, a great friend of the Knights of Columbus, a great brother knight, His Eminence, Sean Cardinal O'Malley. Thank you. Thank you very much, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a joy and an honor to be invited to address this extraordinary gathering. I'm so grateful to God for my almost 40 years of friendship with Carl Anderson, whose life and vocation have been such a blessing for the church. I'm grateful to God for all of the Knights of Columbus and all that you do to spread the faith, to promote the gospel of life, and to build a civilization of love. Some of us had the privilege of accompanying our young people on the World Youth Day pilgrimage with Pope Francis in Rio de Janeiro. Cardinal Dolan and I were blessed to be able to give the catechesis at the Rio Vivo Center, which was sponsored by the Knights of Columbus and where thousands of young Catholics from the United States, Canada and Australia and other English-speaking co communities gathered for prayer, fellowship and catechesis. We were all overwhelmed by the mass on the beach at Copacabana, where a throng of young Catholics that equaled the entire population of Ireland gathered around the successor of St. Peter, our new Holy Father, Pope Francis, the first Pope from the Americas, whose spirit of compassion and love is touching people's hearts all over the world. Following Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict, Pope Francis is challenging us to embrace the new evangelization with new ardor, with new boldness, and with great love for all those who God places in our paths. I spent 20 years in Washington, D.C., and it was there, as I mentioned, that I came to know Carl Anderson. In those days, there was a very curious incident that I will always remember. Wilbur Mills was a longtime speaker in the House and one-time presidential candidate. Mills was involved in a traffic incident in Washington, D.C. in 1974. His car was stopped by U.S. Park Police late at night because he was driving without his lights. Mills was intoxicated, and his face was bruised from a scuffle with Annabella Bastella professionally known as Fanny Fox, the Argentine firecracker. <laughs> in an attempt to escape, they leapt from the car and jumped into the nearby tidal basin. One month later, Mills was to be on the ballot in his home state of Arkansas for re-election to Congress. While his office denied that he had a drinking problem, Jack Anderson reported that if his staff said he can't speak with you now, he's on the floor, it was never clear if Mel's was on the floor of the house or the floor of his office. In the election one month later after the scandal, Mill's challenger used the slogan, 
If you like liquor, sex, and thrills, cast your vote for Wilbur Mills. <laughs> Mills won handily with 60% of the votes. He attributed his victory to the fact that he made a public confession and asked forgiveness for, from his constituency. He explained to them that his problems were a result of cavorting with foreigners. <laughs> for 20 years, I was in Washington, D.C., cavorting with foreigners, <laughs> working at the Centro Católico, the Spanish Catholic Center. I did not, however, find this to be a corrupting influence on my life, but rather an uplifting experience and indeed a great privilege. Coming from a lace curtain Irish community in the Midwest, being thrust into the challenges and the sufferings of the immigrant community was truly an eye-opener for me as a young priest. Shortly after arriving at the Centro Católico, I was visited by a man who was obviously a campesino from El Salvador, who sat across from me at my desk and broke down and wept bitterly. He was so overcome with grief that he was not able to speak. He simply handed me a letter that he had received from his wife in El Salvador. In the letter, she upbraided him for having abandoned her and their six children to poverty and starvation. When the man was able to compose himself, he explained to me that he'd come to Washington, like so many, because of the war raging in his country, it was impossible to sustain his family by farming. So he found a coyote, a smuggler, who brought him to Washington, where he shared a room with several men in similar circumstances, and he washed dishes in two restaurants, one at lunchtime and one at dinner time. He told me that he ate the leftover food on the dirty plates so as not to spend money. He walked to work to save on transportation so that he could send back all the money that he earned to his family. But now, six months later, his wife had not received one letter from him and accused him of abandoning her and his family. I asked him how he sent the money, if he sent checks or money orders, he told me he sent cash. He said, Father, each week I put all the money I earn into an envelope. I seal it and put the stamps on, as people told me how many I needed, and then I drop it in that blue mailbox on the corner. I looked out of the window, and I could see the blue mailbox. The problem was it wasn't a mailbox at all. It was a fancy trash bin. That encounter in my first week at the Centro Católico brought home to me how difficult it is to be an immigrant, to be a stranger in a strange land, and experience countless humiliations and deprivations as one struggles to make enough money to feed one's children. The immigrants turned to the church as their spiritual family, and for their part have contributed so much joy and vitality. In Washington, they have doubled the Catholic population in the last 40 years. The irony is that I went to the monastery, actually, to be a missionary, expecting to be sent to Papua New Guinea or Easter Island, and I spent 20 years in Washington, D.C., working with Central American refugees. When I was in the seminary, in fact, our provincial, Father Victor, wrote a letter to Rome saying that our vice province in Puerto Rico was flourishing and that our province was prepared to take on a new mission. And he said he wanted the most difficult mission in the world. The response was lightning quick. They responded from Rome saying we should immediately open a mission in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. The guardian of Capuchin College in Washington, Father Furman Schmidt, became the first bishop. Friars were sent. Eventually, three of my classmates went. It was reported back to us that when the friars landed in the field in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, the natives came out of the bush. They had never seen Europeans or an airplane, and they were very curious. Through an interpreter, they asked if the plane 
was a male or a female. They said, if it's a female, we want an egg. <laughs> Many years later, as a young friar, the young friar I ordained, who was working in Papua New Guinea, came home to see me on his home visit. He had glorious pictures of smiling natives with bones in their noses, feathers in their hair, and little else in the way of clothing. He pronounced very proudly, this is my parish council. I was particularly intrigued because many of my own pastors in Massachusetts had told me that their parishioners were not ready for a parish council. <laughs> but if Father Provincial were to write today asking for the most difficult mission in the world, we probably wouldn't be sent to Papua New Guinea, but to the United States or England or France or Canada. It's true that so many places in the Western world where secularism and dechristianization are gaining ground. This is the challenge of the new evangelization. It's much harder to preach the gospel in a culture that seems to be vaccinated against the truth in our own country where so many Catholics have stormed off, dozed off, or simply drifted away from the church. Pope Francis is calling on all of us to be missionaries in our own communities. In this new millennium, business as usual is not enough. We must be a team of missionaries, moving from a maintenance mode to a missionary mode. We must ask ourselves, what does it mean to live in a culture of unbelief, a culture which does not even know that it does not believe because it still lives on in the residue of Christian civilization? As Stanley Hauerhaus has expressed it so well, he said, the church exists today as resident aliens, an adventuresome colony in a society of unbelief. As a society of unbelief, Western culture is devo devoid of a sense of journey, of adventure, because it lacks belief in much more than the cultivation of an ever-shrinking horizon of self-preservation and self-expression. Pope Francis is ever warning against a self-referential -re -re church turned in on itself. He tells us to open the door, to invite others in, and through that open door to go out and seek out our brothers and sisters. To be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church is more than a head trip. It's a way of life together. The whole person is engaged in the process. Education for this journey must therefore be experiential, personal, engaging, and life-giving. We learn discipleship the way that we learn a language, by being part of a community that speaks that language. Our young Catholics must be mentored in the faith by others, either peers or older Catholics who are walking the walk. A writer from the early life of the church has all fascinated, always fascinated me. The writing is called The Letter to Dionetus. It's one man writing to a friend of his trying to describe what Christians are like. He says, they live in the same neighborhoods, they speak the same languages, they dress like everybody else, but you know, they don't kill their babies and they respect the marriage bed. They're very quaint indeed. It's a little scary to think that that letter to Dionetus could have been written last week. In today's world, we must promote a Catholic way of life, which is increasingly alien in the secular world, where our concerns about unborn children or the sacred of marriage make us appear quaint and even nettlesome. We need mentors, parents, grandparents, godparents, teachers, youth ministers, neighbors, who are ready to pass on the faith. Pope Francis is calling us to embrace the vision of reality that is the church's faith and that values each and every human being and stresses our responsibility to love and serve each other 
especially the most vulnerable in our midst. The word that Pope Francis repeats over and over again in his talks is tenerezza, tenderness. In the Feast of St. Joseph in his inaugural Mass, Pope Francis speaks to us about protecting people, showing loving concern for each and every person, especially children, the elderly, those in need, who are often the last that we think of. He says, we must not be afraid of goodness or tenderness. He points to the heart of Joseph, his tenderness which is not the virtue of the weak, but a sign of strength of spirit and capacity for concern and compassion and genuine openness to others and openness for love. Some people have said the Holy Father should be speaking more about abortion. I think he speaks about love and mercy to give people the context for the church's teaching on abortion. We oppose abortion not because we're mean or old fashioned, but because we love people. And that is what we must show the world. Recently, I read about an American relief worker in Africa who reported on being in a refugee camp for food distribution. It was very chaotic, even scary. He could see that they were running out of food and that the starving people were desperate. At the end of the line, the last person was a little nine-year-old girl, and the only thing left to give her was a banana. They handed it to her. She immediately peeled that banana, broke it in two, and gave the two halves to her younger brother and sister. Then she licked the banana peel. The relief worker said at that moment he began to believe in God. We must be a better people. We must love all people, even those who oppose us, even those who promote abortion. It's only if we love them that we will be able to help them discover the sacredness of the life of an unborn child. Only love and mercy will open hearts that have been hardened by the individualism of our age. In the United States, we are an immigrant church. It's very significant that the Holy Father's very first trip as Pope was to Lapidusa to underscore his concern for the plight of immigrants. As Archbishop Gustavo pointed out so eloquently in his homily this morning, this is an issue that is of great importance to us American Catholics. When the Holy Father went to the island of Lampedusa, he threw a reef of flowers into the sea where thousands of refugees have perished in the modern day coffin ships that bring refugees from North Africa to Italy. The Holy Father talked about the globalization of indifference, indifference to the suffering of others, to the fate of the unborn, the elderly, the handicapped, the mentally ill, and the immigrants. We must overcome this indifference in our own lives and help people to see that the church's teaching is about loving and caring for everyone. In his talk to the Brazilian bishops last week, Pope Francis said, we need a church capable of rediscovering the maternal womb of mercy. Without mercy, we have little chance nowadays of entering the world of wounded persons in need of understanding of forgiveness and love. The Holy Father alludes to Casper's work on mercy, where he says that mercy without truth would be consolation, without honesty and empty chatter. But on the other hand, truth without mercy would be cold, off-putting, and ready to wound. The truth isn't a wet rag that we throw in someone's face, but it's a warm cape that you wrap around the person to protect and strengthen them. Project Rachel is just this kind of combination of mercy and truth that the church needs to be about. Our efforts to heal the wounds of society will depend on our capacity to love and to be faithful to our mission. The Holy Father is showing us very clearly 
that our struggle is not just a political battle or a legal problem, but that we must evangelize and humanize the culture. Then the world will be safe for the unborn, for the elderly, for the so-called unproductive. The gospel of life is the gospel of mercy. If we are going to get a hearing in today's world, it will be because people recognize that authenticity of our lives and our dedication to building a civilization of love. We are called to live our lives as a service to others and commit our lives to give witness to the presence of God's love and mercy in our midst. I've always liked the story about a man who was very sick and went to the doctor to have a series of tests done. And while he was there, the doctor asked to speak to his wife. And she said, he said, ma'am, your husband is very, very sick, but he will survive if you take very good care of him. If you let him go on fishing trips with his buddies, <laughs> go to the baseball games, give him the remote control for the television set, don't let the children disturb him, don't let his mother-in-law visit. <laughs> said, if you do all of this, there's a good chance that he's going to survive. Well, on the way home, he said to his wife, who was very worried, he said, well, what did the doctor say? What did the doctor say? She said, honey, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> You know, our task is like the story. If we don't go the extra mile, if we don't give our cloak along with the tunic, if we don't turn the other cheek, then the patient will die. As St. Augustine said, without God, we can do nothing. Without us, God will do nothing. Francis said it in Rio, Jesus Christ, is counting on you. The church is counting on you. The Pope is counting on you. May Mary, mother of Jesus and our mother, always accompany you with her tenderness. Go and make disciples of all nations. Amen. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. His Eminence mentioned that he and I have known each other for many years. And when Dorian and I first moved to Washington, D.C. in the 1970s and first met Father Sean, there were over 400 murders a year in our nation's capital. And the young priest at Centro Cattolico used to sleep on the floor each night in his residence in order to avoid bullets from the drive-by shootings in his neighborhood coming through his window or his wall. And if you walk through those same neighborhoods today in Washington, D.C., with his eminence, you'll find that residents will come up and thank Father Sean for what he did for them so many years ago. I have no doubt why it is that Pope Francis has asked his eminence for his advice. And I have no doubt as to the quality of the recommendations his eminence will give our Holy Father. So your eminence, thank you so very much for being with us and for your words and inspiration and your witness.